Welcome to the Behavioral Groups Podcast. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We interview interesting people in order to unlock insights into behavioral science and how we can apply that to work and life. This episode is brought to you by our two companies. Yay! The Lantern Group and Behavior Alchemy, two of the most insightful, yes. focused, smart, yes. dedicated, hardworking, and just plain fun behavioral consultancies in the world. Don't start your work day without them. Absolutely. So today we got to talk to Ruchir Sara, MD, a medtech executive, a cardio electrophysiologist, and entrepreneur. Dr. Sara currently serves as the CEO and president of Resonea Inc., which was founded in 2016. Uh, Resonea's mission is to develop a new standard for understanding sleep breathing and its impact on the human condition. In our conversation with Ruchir, we talked through how his background in human signal processing from the cardiology world helped in developing a new way to diagnose sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a significant disease that is greatly undiagnosed, with almost 80% of the people who have it not being diagnosed. Wow. That sleep apnea doesn't just inhibit your sleep. We talked also about how sleep apnea is a hub disease mm -hmm. that leads to other health, health issues like depression, heart disease, obesity, erectile dysfunction. You mean so getting rid of sleep apnea can help people get off that little purple pill? Potentially, yes. <laughs> we also talked about some of the other impacts that sleep disorders have and the research around those, including the up to $80 billion that it costs businesses in absenteeism, safety issues, and lost productivity. And Tim, here's something I'm sure you found uh, absolutely fascinating is that the idea of playing musical instruments, particularly double reed instruments, can actually improve people's sleep apnea. So well, it can help in curing it. It is it is terrific, and and the fact that we actually brought the didgeridoo <laughs> into the conversation, I yeah, that just right off the charts. Yeah, that good old Australian musical instrument. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ruchir and his team used many behavioral science principles to create and to improve their app. Overall, this was a really fun conversation. We had many laughs and many deep insights. Yes. So listen up. And if you enjoy this, please like it on iTunes or whatever podcatching listening service you use. It really, really helps in spreading the word. And if you're really enthralled, I mean really enthralled. How enthralled? really enthralled, and I'm sure some of you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm banking that some of you are. Please leave a review. Um, it's what all the cool kids are doing these days. It also helps in making sure that we get raised up in those rankings, yeah. and so it helps for others to be able to find us. With that, enjoy our conversation with Ruchir Sarah. Ruchir Sarah, welcome to the Behavioral Groups Podcast. Thank you, guys. Uh, great to chat with you and looking forward to, to chatting over the next few minutes. Good, right, good. Wonderful. Well, thanks for taking time. We're going to start with a speed round. So quick questions. Monet or Michelangelo? Monet. Monet. All right. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about uh, what do we have here? We've got some fun ones here. Uh, how about bicycle or unicycle? Oh, I'd love unicycle. I have no idea, but bicycle is what I'll pick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Expert in an instrument, or would you rather have be an expert in a language? Uh, language. Language. Okay. 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 How about, uh, how, how about uh, sleep, uh, sleep before the big exam or cram before the big exam? Sleep always. <laughs> All right. So then, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make you guess it. I'll make a guess at the next one, uh, which is more important, sleep or exercise? Oh, equally important, but I will say sleep because that's what I'm <laughs> All right. Perfect. And so, so with that, Rushir, let's uh, talk a little bit about what you do because you uh, are kind of a sleep expert and you're working in, uh, you know, identifying, having some tools to identify. So for our listeners who, who probably don't have any idea about what this is. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I got into the area of sleep in a rather circuitous way. Um, by training, I'm a heart rhythm specialist, um, a, a doctor who's a, a cardiac electrophysiologist. We've got a nice long word for ourselves. <laughs> um, yeah. say, that say, say that one again, electro... 
Okay. Electrophysiologist. Electrophysiologist. Okay. So the, the longer the name, hopefully the higher the billing or whatever. I <laughs> Do I need to add some? I need to add some stuff to my. Yeah, my we all need here. longer titles yeah. then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you know. We, uh, a partner and I actually did a lot of research into the area, uh, in the area of human signal processing. So, you know, electrophysiologists do things like EKGs and okay. things in the heart. So we're processing signals for a living, you know, um, heart signals in that case. And, um, you know, we became, he particularly became really good at what we did um, using computer interfaces, advanced algorithms, things like that. Um, and I actually managed to discover the cause of kind of the biggest and hardest to discover heart rhythm problem, um, you know, that people have called atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. We built a company around it. It was, it was successful. It was acquired by Abbott a few years back. And after the acquisition, we said, you know, it, we don't want this to be the end of the road in, in terms of kind of going after big medical problems um, where our skills at looking and listening to signals um, can come in, in handy. And as we started looking at different things, we went to what we knew, cardiology, and looked at all these different potential approaches. And we stumbled across through, um, you know, an unusual trip we made to Australia across the idea of actually um, sleep apnea. And we, we, everybody knows sleep apnea is a common problem. It's understood that this exists out there, but I don't think people realize how big and how common it is. So, for example, you know, um, is sleep apnea a bigger deal in Australia? I'm, I'm so, it, it, so it took the trip to Australia to make this more vivid for you. Well, we were there for a conference on heart rhythm, and you know, we start we started talking to some people who were there for the same conference. They were saying, "Man, you know, it would we find that this AFib gets much better when you treat sleep apnea." And um, it's been known in our literature a little bit, but people haven't really paid attention to it. And there were some papers being presented at that conference that specifically spoke about treating people with sleep apnea, in this case with that mask and pressure called CPAP. Okay. And, and um, how the AFib would go away in some patients. You know, not medications, not the sort of kind of heart catheterization procedures we had helped uh, develop, but, but actually just treating their sleep help their heart rhythm get better, which seemed odd and, and, and unusual. Um, and as we looked into the space even further, um, we realized that it's a huge problem. Most of it goes undiagnosed. So in the US, for example, out of 30 million people with sleep apnea, 80% of them don't know they have it. They're walking around with it and, and it's um, the cause, it's one of these hub diseases. So if you have sleep apnea, it just tends to make other things worse. It's kind of like those old ads for BASF that were the, you know, <laughs> intelligence inside or make the sound better, you know? Yeah. Sleep apnea is like the opposite end of that. Um, so uh, as we researched it, it makes, you know, there's a lot of evidence saying 50% of sleep apnea patients, for example, have depression. And, and treating sleep apnea in many depressive patients helps them get off their mats. Um, heart rhythms I talked about. Patients with heart failure. Um, you know, those who have had heart attacks or just not functioning as well as they, they could be. Managing their sleep apnea helps them become, have more energy and more ability to do normal daily things. And it goes to all extremes to things even as far as erectile dysfunction, which is obviously interesting to uh, men in the audience at, at, at all times. Oh, yeah. I think you've just caught some, at least half the audience's attention right now. Exactly. And then the other half the audience has obtained is that there's actually pretty good papers that say treating sleep apnea can help reduce obesity. And there's, a, there's good physiology underlying that. Wow. Um, so lots of that stuff. And the most recent papers even talk about a, a link. This isn't causal yet, but it's at least a, a link or an association between sleep apnea and dementia when you get older. Mm. Um, so, wow. so it's one of these bad hub diseases and we said, can we do anything about it? Um, to get to the end of the story, we said, you know what? We keep hearing people snore with sleep apnea or they make sound when they breathe. Why don't we try to analyze the sound and see if it correlates well with the results of sleep tests? And that's how we, we got going with this. Did a clinical study, 200 patients who were getting sleep tested in hospital labs. And we found that just listening to them alone, listening to their breathing sounds, characterizing it, analyzing it, we could be really pretty accurate in picking up those who have moderate and severe sleep apnea. And that so just bringing in, this month, actually. bringing in those um, 
uh, signal yeah. components that you guys had worked on prior right. you know, within the cardiac space into right. this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. that is interesting. Okay, so so uh, there's all these disease states that uh, that are hubbed that are on the spoken wheel connected to uh, to sleep apnea. What about the behavioral side? You you've written about about mood you know mood disorders, but. Yeah. But you know, can you can you? Because here we are in behavioral groups. We really are interested specifically in the behavioral side. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the behavioral implications to not yeah. enough sleep or you know poor sleep habits? So there's two sides to this coin. So number one um, is sleep apnea and sleep disorders themselves can affect your behavior. The other side, which uh, I'll describe in a second, is that your behavior can affect your sleep as well so you know sometimes treating certain you know kind of behaviors or characteristics can actually help improve your sleep so starting with that first one um it's been pretty well known in the psychiatry world for a while in fact sleep apnea diagnosis initially started out of psychiatry um, okay. psychiatrists were noticing that their patients with manic depressive disorders depression or even milder versions that weren't such severe disease but they were having trouble sleeping um, they assumed it was the depression causing the trouble sleeping, but as they started examining it and trying to treat the sleep itself, they found the depression would get better or the you know, mania would reduce a little bit. Um, and so hence the field of, of you know, sleep apnea testing was born because they hooked up a bunch of wires and airflow meters and EKGs and said, let's just figure out what in the world's going on in these people um, when we test everything. Um, and obviously they found that when they were having obstruction or blockages to their sleep or just not taking breaths, um, everything was changing. The sleep pattern in the brain was changing. Cortisol was getting released, which is the link with obesity. Cortisol causes you to uh, want to eat sugars and retain fat. Great when you're running from a saber toothed tiger, um, but, uh, you know, but terrible when you're doing it when you're asleep, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's where it was born. And, since then, there's been a, a huge number of articles that talk about the link between mood, behavior, and sleep. So, for example, in children, um, there's been a, a couple of good studies published that looked at, at what lack of sleep, fatigue, or sleep apnea does um, in kids. And, and in kids, sleep apnea is often due to enlarged tonsils. Okay. Um, imagine that can block the airway. Um, what it does, and obviously they find the kids more irritable, but most importantly, they find that they have real trouble with attention and impulse control. So ADHD um, links quite tightly with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea kids will have more ADHD. And so in some kids, let's say it's due to big tonsils, you take the tonsils out, suddenly their ADHD gets better. You know, that seems like a really odd link, right? You know? yeah, crazy. Crazy, but, but, but science is, is bringing these two together. If you think about it, you get more oxygen. More oxygen to your brain means you can kind of pay more attention, you know? Um, so it actually plays through if, if you think of it that way. And oddly enough, some of the treatments we do for ADHD, like um, medicines that may actually sedate the child a little bit, may work against us when it comes to the sleep point, you know? They may get too relaxed. The muscles in their throat may relax too much. So balancing that out actually becomes pretty important. Now, in, in addition to that, they, there's been studies done in military recruits who always seem to be a very willing population for studies. I don't know how, but... Uh, <laughs> They're kind of, uh, yeah, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, just toll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, you're willing, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yes, sir. Voluntold. Voluntold. There you Voluntold. go. Voluntold. I love that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what they found in the recruits is when they sleep deprive them, due to any reason, you know, um, that after about 24 to 48 hours of sleep deprivation, basically, you know, they can't make decisions like they used to, um, which is why the military actually is pretty good about two things. One, experimenting with drugs that change this. Um, okay. So, you know, the military experiments a lot with drugs that can keep your attention going through lack of sleep. And two, cycling people in through, in and out through sleep patterns, making sure people get sleep. So are, are there actually, is there actually a drug that can help you make better decisions on when you, when you lack enough sleep? 
Yeah, there's a couple of drugs. And in fact, um, there's a line, one, one kind of line of drugs um, that specifically is designed for people who have shift work disorder, meaning that they're right. nurses, firemen who work in shifts, um, often have you know, this kind of continuous switching of their sleep-wake cycles. Um, and um, these drugs have been tested. They started from the military. Um, and they've been tested, and it's been found that when you take these drugs, um, they don't necessarily sedate you. Um, but they keep you attentive, but they also let you fall asleep in a much more normal way. And they've measured the brainwave patterns, and they're, they're very healthy brainwave patterns. You know, you, you have REM sleep like you should, deep sleep like you should. So, you know, 24 to 48 hours of wakefulness, they take the drugs, and they have a much more normal sleep pattern than they otherwise would. Okay. Um, these drugs, are, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a big multi-billion dollar drug. They, they do become a bit of drugs of abuse in kind of high performance academic environments. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. oddly enough, we talk about opioids a lot. These drugs have, have a big kind of black market uh, to them as well. Oh, I can, well, I can imagine. I, I just started thinking about all the, uh, all the nefarious reasons why you might, might want to use this. Exactly. You know, nefarious, but, but certainly the darker reasons. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to go back to the sound uh, because uh, as a, a musical guy, I'm interested in what you can tell about, uh, you know, what research there is around, around the sounds that we make and how that relates to our general well-being, our, our actual health. Yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and it starts from the, you know, the basic concept that let's say you're playing a trumpet or a woodwind instrument. You know, you move different, uh, I'm not a great musician, but let's say different buttons or levers, and you adjust the kind of diameter of the instrument or the length of the instrument, um, which you're blowing. And it creates different pitches and sounds. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing can happen in your airway. You know, if I block half the airway, I'm going to make a different sound than if it's completely wide open. Right. Um, in most people, the wide open state is a really quiet breathing sound. Um, but as soon as you start restricting that airflow in any way, and it's different from person to person, you start creating noise. Now, the most obvious noise we all know about is, is loud snoring. You know, okay. Yeah. Where tissue is kind of flapping against, uh, you know, your palate is flapping down in your airway or your tongue or whatever is obstructing. Um, and that's what most people think about with sleep apnea. But it's not always just snoring. It's sometimes just an increased noise pattern, a lengthened kind of uh, louder noise. And so what we went through, it took us about two years, um, is characterizing what is a breath, both normal and abnormal breaths. Um, so once we can figure out what is a breath, we can know when people don't breathe. That's the first fundamental thing. Apnea just means no breath. Yeah. So okay. Once we know what a breath is, we can know when people don't breathe. And then in addition, we can characterize really abnormal breathing. And we found certain patterns that we were able to analyze um, that really very nicely fit in to those patients who were having sleep apnea. And this is just through the sound. This is just through the listening, right? This isn't through, this isn't a visual observation. So. Nothing else. No, all we do is listen. In fact, we listen just through a mobile phone placed at your bedside. Um, it turns out the microphones and mobile phones are pretty good now. And... Uh, so uh, that's all we need is, you know, put a phone at your bedside, keep it about, you know, one or two feet away from your pillow and um, go to sleep. You know, and in the morning, assuming you have good Wi-Fi, we've analyzed it in the cloud and we can tell you your risk. Wow. And, yeah. and does pitch have anything to do with this, Richier? Uh, it, it, like, are, are, you listening for, are you listening for cadence or do you actually listen to, to the pitch, the, the high or low aspects of the sound? Yeah, so the answer is all of the above. We listen to volume, pitch, oh. frequency, and um, frequency in two ways. You know, what's the actual frequency of the noise and also how often you're okay. hearing these breath sounds. Okay. Um, so we take all of that into account and do, you know, basically do a lot of math on it. And, uh, <laughs> and it turns out, you know, it becomes relatively easy once you, once you apply some of these, uh, you know, these tools to it. We are doing some work, and this will probably take us another couple of years, trying to get a signature of your breath versus your breath versus my breath, um, so that we, you know, down the road, you'll be able to kind of normalize to yourself. Mm. You know? So this is your breathing pattern. I mean, uh, obviously, you can, you can imagine the uses could be very useful as you age, 
or something changes in your life, you know, hey, how's my breathing compared to when I was feeling better or feeling worse? Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so in those cases, pitch will matter a lot, actually. Okay. You know, because uh, then once you got your signature breath, and then you just have that with you, you know, uh, on your files. So, so tell us a little bit about the app and what you guys do. So just to, to let our listeners understand, they can go out. Um, and as you said, you, you, you get this app, you download it. And as we were talking, just getting our play button and everything up here, <laughs> you've done a lot of testing around how your play button works, various different pieces. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, our app is called Drowsel. Um, we've actually designed it for, you know, kind of healthcare providers and employers to give out to their, you know, patients slash employees. Okay. And um, we, what we realized when we got into sleep apnea, you know, we love doing our cool techie things and doing math. Uh, right. So, hey, we've got this great math solution. We can analyze sound. But we realized the problem in this market was much more than that. The problem in this disease wasn't just that people weren't, identifying and diagnosing they weren't really stepping through the next few stages because it's a really weird medical disease where one group does the testing another person writes the prescription for the treatment and then the patient kind of gets lost um, nobody's really doing follow-up you know yeah. and so we said we had to kind of solve this whole problem at once um, you know the standard for example if you're getting a CPAP machine from your insurance company is you have to prove that you use it for 90 days. And that proof is defined as four days a week. And then after 90 days, you're good to go. Um, now, if I were to tell you, hey, you've just been diagnosed with diabetes, your sugars are good for 90 days, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, it's ridiculous. Um, really it's a weird chronic disease, nobody follows up. And so we've actually built that into our um, whole software is that in addition to getting you screened, we can, if you need, hand you to a telemedicine doctor who can help you through the diagnosis process and the treatment. And then we can do follow up with you, ask you quality of life questions, retest you when something's changed. Um, if you're doing something new, let's say you lost 20 pounds, you wanna see how things are going. All right, just do another test tonight. And the, the whole focus in what we designed is because there wasn't a perfect specialty to follow these patients, we said, you can be in charge of your own care in this case. Okay. You know, so the patient controls their data, the patient follows themselves. And right now, over the next six months, we're going to build in a number of gamification features that go beyond just sleep apnea. They talk about sleep health and, you know, like we're thinking we're, this is all drawing board stuff, but you're going to take a journey, you know, a sleep journey, and you're going to have an avatar that's, a, you know, kind of like a pirate looking person, and you're going to travel the world and do different things. And, uh, you know, the more activities you do, the more, let's say, surveys you fill out or the more kind of sleep health habits you do, you get bonus coins uh, in, into your treasure chest, you know. Which is really interesting. I mean, we talked a little bit about the behavior, again, behavioral grooves, talked a little bit about the behavior impacts of sleep and what that can do on different things. But you're also looking at this in the development of the actual app and product that you have and, and bringing in behavioral science you talk about gamification uh, before we started this you talked about hey that that play button or the record button <laughs> is 40 percent of obviously that was done because you're realizing you know from a behavior perspective people weren't easily getting to the play button when it was smaller than that so it, help us understand how you're bringing some of that behavioral science into into the app yeah, it's great. You know, we're just learning this along the way. And, and actually, it was pretty eye-opening when we chatted before a few months ago because it made us think even harder about it. But we knew we wanted the, the user interface to be something, rather than just being cool, it has to be something that's usable. Yeah. Um, so we worked pretty obsessively. And, you know, that meant, uh, and, and we have a, a kind of saying in our um, development group, in the software group, is that, you know, know thy user because it is not thee. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, and, and this is a common problem in software development is that the software developers design it for something they're comfortable with. And they're not the user, right. you know? And so we, we kind of mapped out our demographic as being, you know, middle-aged, um, which would probably be the, the middle of the bell curve. Yep. And what will middle-aged people be comfortable doing up to older ages. And we actually tested it with 
um, a few volunteers, you know, as we were developing the app, who were videotaped while they were using the app. And we had two cameras on them. Yeah. And one camera looked at what they were doing with their fingers, and the other camera was to their face. And there was a questioner in the room too, who would occasionally ask them, why did you do that? Yeah. Um, but it was fascinating. Sometimes they wouldn't verbalize what they were doing, but they'd have these confused looks on their faces, you know, when they were looking. <laughs> and we'd look right at the screen, and what were they doing? And their finger was wandering around, and they didn't know where to go. That led to a huge, we, we changed about 30 or 40 things in our app um, just based on that videotaping experience. It's really interesting. We just did a podcast uh, with Dan Hill, who does facial um, coding. Uh, mm -hmm. That's his whole business is looking at faces and coding and understanding. And so when you talk about, you know, that confused look, they may not say something. And that's what he's saying, too, is that the, there's this element that we don't always fully understand our our emotions, right, and, and how we do. And we definitely don't verbalize them very well. And so, but actually looking at your face, which has all the muscles that are connected directly to your skin and different pieces, and that's where we've evolved yeah. to be able to look at somebody and see yeah. that emotion really can impact how we understand what is actually going on behind it. It's, it. it's a lovely point because, um, you know, what's interesting is, is that the person often doesn't know they even made that facial gesture. You know, in fact, the interviewer in the room didn't pick it up. Yeah. We had to go back to the tape, so to speak, you know, and we're like, oh, this, right. this one spot confused almost every user. Yeah. You know? um, the record button was one of those things where, you know, it looked like a normal, you know, any recording app you would have, um, but people weren't sure how to pause it, people, you know, because we made it the same size as all the other buttons. When we made it bigger, um, then it started standing out, you know, that, that people could understand. Yeah. It's funny, you know, you would, these, are, these are simple things, but easy fixes. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 can, and simple, small things that can be huge problems if they're not addressed as well. Yes. So uh, you're, you're asking also another really big behavioral question, and that is the, the idea of the patient uh, self being, uh, really managing their own care. Um, yeah. That to a large degree, right? You're kind of turning over that responsibility to uh, to people, and and I'm I'm just wondering what um, you know, kind of what what thoughts do you have about that? What what are the issues that you're tackling uh, with? Yeah, it's it's a, I, the answer is you know we're kind of figuring this out as we're doing it. Um, I am just a fundamental believer that patients should own their own medical care. I think if we give people the right tools, they can do that. Now, if we give them the wrong tools, like let's say the report from a sleep study today that is very medically looking, and it's got a bunch of uh, jargony words that a patient can't understand, of course they can't understand it. Right. But if we give people the right tools, um, which is you know provide the data in a way they can interpret it, mm -hmm. um, there's no rocket science going on here. You know, I mean, the rocket science is the algorithm doing the math. Right. But the results. Right. You know, it should be something we can all understand and explain. Um, and the reason we believe in the primacy of the patient is because you're the one who cares the most if you're the patient, you know. Yes, you see, let's say a really engaged doctor will see you once a month or once every two months. And they will care about you for sure and try to do the right thing. But you're living this every day. Yeah. Like, like you said, this is a chronic this is a chronic disease state. The let's check back in 90 days, <laughs> you know, or you're fine for the next 90 days. It's kind of crazy. You're going to be living it every single night, every single day. Yeah. And I, I think this can apply to lots of diseases, but sleep apnea is a perfect one because it's very symptom driven. You know, this disease gets better or worse based on, you know, how did you sleep last night? How are you feeling today? Yeah. You know, the only person who knows that is the patient. You know? So how do you think this will be different from, uh, I, I think about the, the, uh, the research done on people who've had heart attacks, uh, and then they go through an open heart surgery, and after the recovery phase, they're feeling, they're feeling really good. They, they often yeah. feel like a, like a new person. Um, yes. and, and because of that, they don't adhere to the dietary or exercise regimens that are often prescribed to them. Yeah, I, I, you know, I told you we looked in the cardiology spaces and stuff like that. It, this is really hard to figure out. And, and I think we have to make more effort in medicine uh, to try to figure this out. Or we have to get somebody outside of medicine helping us figure this out. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I call it the baloney in the fridge effect. You know, that most patients post heart attack are going to have a really nice looking fridge. 
you know, it's going to have all the right stuff that they've gotten because they got scared. Yeah. yeah. Um, but three to four months later, they're fully recovered. They're feeling better. And the baloney shows up in the fridge again. <laughs> Those Oreos are in the cover. Uh, <laughs> ice cream is in the freezer. Right. And yeah. Behaviorally, they're looking for anything to justify that because they kind of know in the back of their head that probably isn't right. Um, so they look at a, a, you know, kind of report that comes out on, on the web that says, oh, butter is okay now. Mm-hmm. You know, butter's, butter's better than margarine. And um, that report just said, if you're completely healthy, butter's okay. Yeah. <laughs> if but you've had have, a heart attack, butter's terrible for you. You know, yeah, We have this, this beautiful confirmation bias that, that allows us to just selectively pick those wonderful things that will make us feel better about our, our standard self. It is. So I think we've got to take a completely different approach. I mean, we scare people a lot and that's, that has its own effects, but yeah. um, the, the smoking cessation stuff that I've read is really something we have to aspire towards, which is showing people black lungs didn't really do it. Yeah. Telling them that their breath stinks and we don't like them, you know, that did, or they don't look as good and they get wrinkly on their face. Yeah. You know? Um, that had much more effect, you know, because that hits to the vanity effect. Well, and it hits to a certain component about what are some of those underlying drives as, as, as human beings, right? And we always think, well, our life and different things, but we have a hard time visualizing that. We have an easy yeah. time visualizing my connection with somebody. I, I want to be dateable or my spouse and, you know, yeah. being kissable and those types of things. And those have an immediate impact on us. And so there's the, a temporal component to all of this uh, and the ease of being able to actually visualize the, the impact of that having uh, an impact on our lives. Yeah, Yeah. no, it's, it's a very good point. I mean, so much of our brain is dedicated to visual processing that what we see actually matters. And I actually think in sleep apnea, the whole CPAP mask image really hurts the, the adoption of, and treatment of this disease. You yeah. Know? Even, uh, even when we're sleeping, we don't want to appear like a monster. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I, I've always wondered why they didn't actually try to design really cool, like, okay, if you're going to sound like Darth Vader, look like him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Put on a Darth Vader mask, you know, get the Trekkies at least treating their sleep. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you know. oh, I, I, I love that, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know there was another blog that you wrote about the impact of sleep and work. And so I know we have a lot of listeners who, you know, have a business bent to them. But what are some of those uh, uh, components around work? And I know you brought in some, some data here. And let me just pull this up as, you know, there's a, an element of almost uh, 20 to, to $80 billion in, in uh, some impacts around this and various other pieces. So help us understand a little bit about the impact that sleep or some of these other sleep disorders have with work. You know, so this gets to a little more on the, you know, what you guys talk about a lot is the link between behavior and sleep and, uh, and other things is that, you know, when you're trying to modify employee behavior to do something right or be safer and things like that, mm-hmm. we often don't take into account that that employee is not, you know, an automaton and day to day, how the employee responds to that behavioral stimulus may vary based on how they're doing. Yeah. You know, so if you're fatigued and haven't gotten good sleep or you didn't get enough oxygen overnight, you're going to be less responsive to that behavioral stimulus than you were before. So it, it, it manifests itself in the workplace. Um, the one hardest to measure in decreased productivity, the ones much easier to measure absent from work, number one cause of absence is, is a sleep disorder. Um, and number two, and then the other thing is accidents and safety issues, yeah. drivers getting into crashes, you know, things like that. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah. a major issue. Um, and again, as you mentioned at the beginning, an undiagnosed issue in, in a lot of people. Uh, and so I think there's some interesting elements here that bring this all together, so. Absolutely. Cool. Ruchir, we also, uh, we always like to talk a little bit about music. And I know that yes. uh, this, this, this causes a lot of consternation with a lot of our guests. Uh, um, let's, 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 be, let's be clear. Tim likes to talk about <laughs> okay. music. And I afford him that opportunity. You afford, you afford me that opportunity. 
opportunity. I could just tell by the way you were like squirming in your seat, like, oh no, we're really gonna do it. Oh no, I I, I actually did some research late last night. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, I can't believe how much there is about music and sleep and everything out there. So I've uh, you know I've got something interesting I found. Uh, then but, enlighten uh, us, enlighten us. So you, know, uh, you know people are, and it led I, actually late last night. I even put another blog together about it, which I'll post soon. But um, we always talk about soothing music helping us relax and go to sleep, right? Yeah. You know? And there is a lot of data about at least mild effects in, in the right type of music helping you go to sleep. Students going to sleep better, meta-analyses of many studies looking across it. Um, but the, the interesting kind of line of research I came across was completely different. And it was looking at using musical instruments to treat sleep apnea. Uh, okay. So I, that sounds odd, right? So what what um apparently what started this whole thing was there was a paper in the british medical journal in 2006 where a group in switzerland of all places trained people to use the didgeridoo oh yeah you know you know, back to australia, back to australia. australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and and so a didgeridoo instructor in switzerland and they randomized people in, into two groups i think it was like 25 people total and half the people got didgeridoo instructions for three weeks and the other half were put on the waiting list. So they were the control group. Okay. And they, they, they all had sleep apnea and they tested their sleep test scores over time. And they found the people who learned how to use the didgeridoo, they had like a 30 or 40% improvement in their, their sleep apnea. Oh my gosh. <laughs> By learning to use this instrument, you know? And, and uh, so there's been actually a lot of work done in this area afterwards, not all with didgeridoo, but with wind instruments. They've surveyed members, you know, thousand plus members of US orchestras and tried to see if there was any reduction in sleep apnea in those who played wind instruments. And, and, and well, it's, it's mixed, of course. The, the general survey on wind instruments did not see a big difference from the other uh, parts of the orchestra. But there was one study that found if you specifically play double reed instruments, like the oboe, yeah. Um, there, there actually was a significant difference in, in oboe players and other double reed players in how much sleep apnea they had. Um, and the working hypothesis was maybe you need a lot more pressure. And so those muscles in your throat really become strong and, and get better tone um, to play those instruments. I mean, what do you think about that? That, that makes total sense to me. Were you, were you, I don't have any clue as to what a double reed instrument is versus a non-double reed <laughs> stuff. So I will let it to the experts. Well, I, so I, I, I know a bunch of uh, oboe and bassoon players, you know, yeah. double reed instruments. And, and they're like, they sometimes talk about how, you know, they get, they get uh, you know, sort of calluses, you know, on their, on their lips from, from the pressure. And okay. so they, the, the muscles in their mouths are significantly more developed than the average bear. Uh, and of course, it would make sense that because you do need a lot more pressure in, in your diaphragm, that your, your voice box and your, your throat would have to develop muscles as well. That, that's intuitive to me. I can see that connection. Okay. I, think that, I think that's terrific, actually. <laughs> well, and, uh, thank the Swiss didgeridoo instructor for pulling this oh, one. There you go. Oh, well, oh, that, that's, that's oh, interesting. Oh, so uh, this also says, Guitarists are screwed. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Drummers, guitarists, you know, yeah. violinists, any of those. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to go back though, because uh, and just bring it back to a personal level with me is is that I actually use uh, sleep phones, which is uh, basically a headband that has speakers in it uh, to to fall asleep at night, or if I wake up in the middle of the night to fall back asleep when my brain is processing too much by listening to music, and I don't have to wake my wife up um, with the, the music I have. But I find it interesting in, in you know, it's a, the relaxing or calming music and various different things. For me, I actually, I, I can fall asleep to a variety of different music uh, going on, whether it be my uh, industrial heavy thumping music or a more lighter kind of non- Interesting. Yeah. So it I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It, I, I, I haven't noticed a difference. I haven't done a, a, a nice full-on study of saying how long it takes me to fall asleep with either. But I, I, I 
I tend to, to change it up every once in a while. I don't yeah. know if there's anything there. One, one of the smaller studies actually allowed the users to put their own music on yeah. and compared it to users who were forced to listen to their, quote, soothing music. Mm -hmm. And they didn't find a difference, actually. So, okay. uh, so it may be the familiarity with the music or it just kind of fades into the background. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. For me, I find that it it tends to lessen the conversation that is going on that is that I'm ruminating about that keeps me up in in, in those times. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the sleep phones work nice because I also toss and turn, and so not having you know specific oh. earphones on or various different things allows me to. And, and it looks pretty cool too. It's, 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 <laughs> it's pretty, a headband. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, exactly. So. No, it's really interesting. In fact, one of our kind of, uh, you know, poster child, so to speak, is not a child at all, is a drummer um, who didn't want to get the CPAP mask done, um, but was one of our beta testers. And he turned out to be quite positive for sleep apnea. He got the oral appliance and, and in three months after he got it, he lost 30 pounds, he's exercising more, he's eating better. Um, he's also a computer, a software engineer. That's his primary job. Um, and he drums on the side, but, uh, you know, he talks a lot about, you know, how it never used to bother him when he was young to play till three in the morning, you know, yeah. the club and all that. And he just started noticing everything started slowing down and he didn't know why. And once he got treated, he felt young again, you know, so. Love that. Yeah. Love that. And that's a great story to end on. Ruchira, we want to thank you very much for your time and joining us in the Behavior Group studio today. Yes. Virtually. Virtually. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim and Kurt, and uh, looking forward to chatting with you again. All Absolutely. Right. Thanks for sharing. Bye now. Hello, folks, and welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavioral groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our tiny little <laughs> baby doll heads. <laughs> no, wait, we don't have baby doll heads. We have big craniums. <laughs> <laughs> that are sorely underutilized. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they definitely are underutilized. Yeah. Uh, so, Tim, tell me, what did you uh, find interesting uh, from Ruchir's talk? Sleep or cram. Sleep or cram. Tell me more. Oh, man, that just totally... It, it was it was confirmation bias for me, right? <laughs> it really was because I have I believe that since I was in high school, when big exams were coming up, and it was like, oh man, what should I do? And I chose to sleep. And of course, I did poorly on the exams anyway. But but I but I was always believing that I would rather go into the exam feeling better and and not know than have tried to stay up and felt poorly and, and kind of weak minded and just weak overall and not do well. See, I was the opposite. You were a crammer. Oh, I crammed. I pulled all nighters. I have done that. And multiple times to great effect. Like, did you just totally ace those, those, uh, those all nighters? You know, I think I was so tired. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is interesting. Um, I will tell you this. Um, I, I know when I first started the lantern group and we had, um, some projects and, and some of those projects were tight diet deadlines and all of these different things and we had to get them done and the fact of the matter is I stayed up late doing a lot of those things the error rate that I had in those whether they be typos whatever that would be was significantly higher than when I did get a lot of sleep so wow uh, it was noticeable it was very noticeable yeah um, and, and at the point I, you know, at midnight or 2 a.m. when I'm working on these things, I'm not noticing that. I'm thinking I'm doing this great job and look, I'm almost done and it was due tomorrow and I am now I can. But, but uh, you know, subsequently when the client comes back and says, yeah, you got like 10 different typos in there all across Ouch. the board. Oh. Now, I am not good with typos in the first place, as oh. you know. So uh, I'm, the, I'm, the lack of sleep. I will neither confirm didn't. nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. I love spell check. Okay. And so that, that just blew me away. Yeah. Honestly, that really captured my imagination right up front. And, and of course the conversation really flowed from there, but yeah. that, that was really big for me. How about you, Kurt? What, what, what really nabbed your attention? So I think the big piece was the low diagnosis rate of sleep oh, apnea. Yeah. And then all of the, 
uh, different diseases that it lends itself into. So again, you know, 80% of people having it don't realize that they have it. The fact that it has a comorbidity with obesity, with um, heart disease, with depression, what, 50% of people yes. with sleep apnea yeah. have depression? Yeah. That's significant. And yeah. it, it blew me away, even though it shouldn't, right? Sleep is a vital piece, and all of the research on the past 10, 20 years has really highlighted the importance of sleep. So, you know, I think that was what blew me away. Well, I saw just uh, a couple of days ago, uh, as we were getting prepped for this, uh, for this uh, grooving session, I saw that uh, Ariana Huffington was giving Elon Musk... A hard time in the press about uh, about Elon Musk sleeping. First of all, working 120 hours a week, which I I, I can't get my head around. No, uh, and sleeping at the factory at the yeah. Tesla factory. And and she said, uh, "quote All the recent scientific findings show the opposite is true. In other words, you know, working hard doesn't doesn't work." Uh, and she said that people perform better when they take time to refuel and recharge. So. And I'm nothing taken away from Ms. Huffington. She's a bright, successful woman. But even she knows it. And why, <laughs> why can't Elon Musk know that? Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you would think as smart as he is, you would think that he would get it. But I think it, get, it comes into our own biases, our confirmation <sighs> components yeah. around there. Um, well, fortunately, again... I'm not susceptible to those, so you're going to have to tell me about how that works, Kurt, because it sounds interesting when we're talking about it, but I just, it just, I just never suffer from that stuff. Yes, I know. You're <laughs> absolutely beautiful, wonderful. Okay, okay, okay. Um, you tried Drowsel, right? You downloaded. I did. It. Can, can I we tried, talk about that? I, I tried Drowsel, and I wish I had better um, information to give you because uh, I tried it, and and my phone didn't have enough memory on it. So lesson number one, make sure you have enough memory left on your phone. Take those pictures, send them up to the cloud, do everything else. So, um, but in, uh, so before that, and I, I will uh, try it again and maybe at some other point we can come back to this at some point. Because, Let's uh, do. Yeah, that'd be I, good. I, I, I do wonder if I'm part of that 80% of the undiagnosed. Um, but regardless, besides that, the app itself, very easy to use. Um, it was downloaded it. Uh, there was some basic information that I had to uh, fill in about date of birth, weight, height, all of those things. And then there were some surveys that I ended up doing as well, which were a sleep apnea risk survey that had questions on it on, about snoring and do people mention you snore and are you tired? And then there's a daytime sleepiness survey uh, and then a personal health risk or risk factor survey. Okay. So very short, not not long by any means. It took no more than five minutes probably to, oh, to do all not, three of those surveys. So you didn't have to, you know, uh, set aside a meeting room for an hour to get through this. Stuff. No, it was, Easy. you know, do you get sleepy or doze off while sitting and reading? Never, sometimes, often, very often. So okay. you fill out questions like that. Very, very easy interface. And then the hardest part for me of this whole thing, besides not having enough memory, <laughs> yeah. was you need to be sleeping alone because obviously the the app works by... Listening. Listening. Yeah. And so if you have two people sleeping in the room on the bed... Uh, there I might be multiple sounds. Multiple sounds. And so uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to do that, <laughs> my daughter was sick one night and was sleeping up in my bed with my, you know, next to my wife. So I went down and slept on her bed, and that's when I used it. Well, um, that's that's a good model, right? Yeah. That that's a good reason to to take out Drowsel and and give it a shot. Yeah, and good, so a good situation. Yeah, so that was that was there. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have results, but uh, the the actual use case for this very easy to use. So it's listening for pitch, for volume and frequency, right? And then it uses an, an algorithm, right? That actually mm -hmm. does all the work. But your phone has to be able to record the entire <laughs> night's sleep. Okay. okay, good, good, good for folks to know. We interrupt this regularly scheduled podcast with an update from Kurt on his use with Drowsel. <laughs> yes, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. I had the opportunity to actually 
use the device. Uh, my phone memory actually worked, and it was basically user user error because what I ended up doing was not having it hooked up to the high speed internet, which was really the problem. With that it. was the problem. That okay. was really the problem. Anyway, wanted to give everybody an update. So I did it for two nights in a row. Uh, again, really easy to use. Hardest part was sleeping alone. Uh, which I did for two nights in a row. Because uh, you're used to sleeping with a partner. <laughs> usually, just, usually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, I'm married and yeah. one of those fun things. Um, but the, the interesting thing, so so turned it on, it recorded uh, throughout the night. The end of the morning, I basically closed it out. Uh, it sent it off to Drowsel, uh, and then uh, within a few hours, I got a report back. Uh, and the report came back. It sent me an email as well as then on the app itself. Uh, just for people, in case you care, I don't think you really do, but I'm at a moderate risk for breathing issues. So, well, well, and that report's pretty detailed. It's not just it's not just a moderate. There's actually some good data behind it that looks like it it's coaching you on some specific areas that are problematic. Right? Very much so. And again, from a behavioral science perspective, very easy to use. Four gauges, circles that show me a number one moderate, uh, two is how I scored on my sleep apnea risk survey, uh, then my daytime sleepiness symptom survey score, and then the longest time I stopped breathing uh, during the night, which at one point was 28 seconds, which seems really long. Wow, that does seem like a long yeah. time. So, and then it gets into some more details, some nice graphics. Uh, you know, how many times did I stop uh, sleeping or breathing, <laughs> sleeping? Um, stop breathing for longer than 10 seconds. Um, one night it was eight and one time it's 15. Um, and then it gives you a summary and the summary is very descriptive and helps you understand what they you should do. And obviously I think this is based upon the information that you have. So it's tailored to. So, so are you a fan? I am. I am. It was, it was easy to use. Uh, next time I go into my, my physician, I'm actually going to bring my uh, app out and talk to her about it. So I think from that perspective, really good, good stuff to have. So terrific. Now we return you to your regularly <laughs> scheduled grooving session. <laughs> yeah. So what other things did you find interesting? I know there were a number of things that we baloney in the fridge, baloney in the fridge. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I loved his, uh, uh Richard, I call it the baloney in the fridge effect. Exactly. It's like it has a, <laughs> it's know. the scientific <laughs> baloney in the fridge effect. Tell us, tell us what, what about the baloney in the fridge effect was so important. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is, um, really problematic, right? With, with, uh, disease states, uh, and people who go through surgery, mm -hmm. um, you know, change or die, right? Yeah. It gets back to uh, Alan Deutschman's uh, yeah, book, right? book and, and the article in Fast Company from yeah. many, many years ago. Uh, I, if I remember, I think one of the original studies said something like, over the long term, as few as 4 or 5% of people who have open heart surgery fully embrace the dietary and exercise regimens that are prescribed by their by their physicians. Yeah, I believe it was 11% after two years is what the change or yeah. die component said. And again, this was for people who had had um, major heart surgery, whether it be stents put in, variety of other things. So their symptoms went away. That pain that they had went away. But the the component was... It's just a temporary fix. Yeah. This is not uh, a way to solve the issue. The way you solve the issue is through these other components, exercise, eating healthier, stop smoking, don't drink as much, be less stressed, all of those factors. And that after two years, it was 11% of the people were still fully compliant with their doctor's treatment. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty small percentage. It is a really small percentage. Yeah. And it... it you can think about this too in just uh, drug adherence across many different types of things. When you're talking when about the, therapeutic drugs, therapeutic drugs, yeah. yes, <laughs> or recreational well, drugs. Well, however, just, if you wanted to use, the, just wanted to clarify. <laughs> no, the the fact is when they are solving for issues that don't necessarily have a. Um, impact on how you're feeling. So in other words, high blood pressure um, medication, uh, cholesterol lowering medication, 
the adherence rate on those is significant, is really small. In some cases, it's about 20%. So in other words, people get their first uh, prescription, and then only 20% of the people actually refill it. So that behavior change that's required it doesn't occur, yeah. and it's crazy. I had a model growing up. My father was an alcoholic and a lifetime smoker, and he he went cold turkey on both successfully wow. for the for the remainder of his life. Uh, in, in different periods, he was about fifteen years dry, and he was about eight or nine years uh, off of cigarettes uh, at the point that he that he passed away. But uh, but he was successful in maintaining complete sobriety, uh, which. It didn't surprise me, of course, as I was growing up. It was just, well, that's just what you do, right? You 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 stop drinking, so you you just stop. You just don't do it anymore. Um, but it is interesting that when we look at the data overall, staying on course to a major behavior change in your life is brutally hard. It is brutally hard. I know, and I might not have the stats right, but people actually going back to Chad Emerson and and our conversation with Chad, I know people who are going through recovery, uh, alcoholism or drugs, typically the average is four to five relapses going back into treatment. So if you think about that, there are some like your father who, you know, cold turkey and stop. They did it. So on an average, that means some of these people are going back eight, nine, 10 times. That just sounds like torture. Yeah. And and to that degree, they know they have an issue, or oftentimes they know they have an issue, but it is so hard to change in some of those types of situations. It really gets quite crazy. But back on to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> back to sleep. Let's go back to sleep. <laughs> okay. I wish I could go back to sleep oh, many of these days. Yeah. The, the other thing I yeah, thought, what else? I thought this was just fun, was the idea about how much of our brain is on visual processing and the fact that oftentimes we don't do things because of the perceived visual impact and how we, it won't make us look good. And and we talked about about the the CPAP. CPAP? (laughs) Yeah. Even though we're sleeping, right? You're sleeping and you wear this and they're not pretty Uh, folks. If you've ever seen one, you don't know they're, they're really not pretty. And I love the idea of why couldn't we just make one that looked like a Darth Vader mask and had the Darth Vader sun? Make it cool. Make it, Give you it. know, space agey something. Again, using some yeah. behavioral design components so that this is cool as opposed to a monstrosity. Absolutely. Well, just as they did, and, and I'm a product guy, uh, so I loved it when Rachir was talking about how just raise it, just making the, the button, like the, the activation button on, on the app, like 40% bigger than what they had originally had because people were missing it. Yeah. Um, that I think that's really important. You're, you're actually getting out the app right now. I am. I'm looking at it, and if you see, I mean, the record it's monstrous. button is, is big and red, and... It yeah. says so start recording and nothing else on the page except for some some visual components. Yeah, so, yeah. Nice yeah. nice and clean. Let's get back to sleeping and tie it into music. <laughs> <laughs> we already did that inside of the conversation. Well, let's talk about what you do because you and you have admitted to being a, uh, uh, a guy who has trouble sleeping uh, from time to time and that you use the sleep phones mm-hmm. and that... Is it correct that you can fall asleep to basically anything? I can. I tend to fall asleep to my Pandora station of Angus and Julia Stone, yeah, which okay, we've talked right, about before, right. my, which then plays not just their music, but others. But yes, I, I have been known to have some of my ministry and Nine Inch Nails playing in the background wow. and falling asleep to that. Wow. And do you, do you do, and do you choose it? Do you say, okay, this is what I'm going to fall asleep to tonight? Sometimes, yes. Wow. Yes, yes. Actually, there are times where it's just like you know, I just I'm got to have I, some I'm in that aggressive kind of mode, and I just uh, wow. I just need something. You know, one of the things about uh, that I talk about um, with people is that I, I think there's a part of me that likes some of that industrial heavy stuff because it 
reminds me that no matter how bad my life is, it definitely can't be as bad as these guys who are singing about what they are singing about and yeah. just the anger and some of that that is going on. I go, oh, yeah, my life's not that bad. Yeah, well, as a songwriter, you can't, you uh, songwriters can't write songs that are just like, yeah, you know, life is just not so great. Yeah, that, that won't work. You've got to write a song that life is just on the verge of, you know, uh, Armageddon, you know. You can't, you just, as a, you, you can't write a song that's like, yeah, I had kind of a tough day. That won't work. There's, there's nothing worth listening to if you, I just had a tough day. Yes, it, it is. No. It's the human condition. That's, we should have a whole genre about, you know, yeah, it was, a, just, it was an okay day. It was kind of tough. Moderately tough. <laughs> moderately depressing. Oh, yeah, okay. All just right, a whatever. normal everyday day. Had its ups and downs. <laughs> Can't you see some country songs about that? No, no. Country <laughs> country songs are, it's either really great or, oh man, when she left me, it broke my heart for the rest of my life. You she know? left me, but I got over it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not, or she not. didn't leave me. We got in a fight, but it's okay. Or we, we had an amicable breakup. We, yeah. There's nothing. <laughs> you can't write songs about amicable breakups. You just can't. <laughs> I'm going to look and research. There has to be songs about amicable re- breakups out there somewhere. I, I'll find one and we'll bring it up the next time. So anyway, okay. do you ever fall asleep to music, Mr. Uh, musician? Almost never. Okay. Almost never. Um, occasionally I do. I'm actually recording an, a record of, of meditations uh, that, that are just acoustic guitar, just solo acoustic guitar no voice no nothing else just just um just meditations basically on on guitar yeah um for the purpose of people being able to relax to it but now that you say you'll listen to nine inch nails before you go to bed i don't know if there's going to be an audience for this (laughs) (laughs) well there is an interesting piece i i also have another app um that is called i'm looking it up right now it's called sleep genius which supposedly uses uh research from the NASA program on getting binomial, is that the right term for the type of, of musical beats that they use that help with uh, sticking with what you're doing? Um, various um, different things. It's very... I want to call a, a friend. Thorough, <laughs> kind of, you know, really relaxing music and so i've used that quite often too to help fall asleep with with some success yeah with some success yeah um you know they they recommend uh again they have it it's a in a either in a 90 minute um session 180 minute session or all night session that you listen to wow um because again your sleep patterns you you supposedly do a 90 minute sleep cycle and falling through all the different stages of sleep and so they get you through one full episode with a 90-minute component. And so very interesting. I had no idea we would end up here when we started this grooving session. <laughs> no idea. We never know where we're going to end up no. in our grooving sessions. No. So thanks for listening, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if we just <laughs> bored you to death with that last component. But uh, hopefully we didn't. And if we did not, please rate us well and share it with a friend.